inches, a fatal bullet wound, by a few yards capture, and by an unexplained lack of action, certain capture or death. The general was Ulysses Grant, later commander of the Union Army and still later president of the United States. The Confederacy held Columbus, Kentucky at the time, opposite Belmont, Missouri. In early November of 1861, General Grant, then stationed at Cairo, Illinois, was ordered to stop the Confederate military movements in southeast Missouri. He sent 3,000 men under Colonel R.J. Oglesby after General M. Jeff Thompson. Three days later, Grant began operations to keep the Confederates from sending more troops across the Mississippi and attacking Oglesby from the rear. By then, the Confederates had about 2,500 men at Belmont under Brigadier General G.J. Pillow. The Union Army landed on the Missouri shore early that morning and started toward Belmont about 8 a.m. In the early skirmishes, Grant's horse was killed. That was close call number one. But his inexperienced troops drove the Confederates across a nearby river. The young soldiers, however, upon reaching the southern camp, dropped their attack and started ransacking the Confederate tents. The southerners, seeing they weren't being pursued, began a flanking movement. They went upriver, back across the stream, and began to move to get between Grant's men and their transport boats still moored to the shore. Grant had no wagons to take away captured property, so he had his men destroy as much as possible. The men, knowing their situation, was near panic and thought of surrender. But the general told them they had cut our way in and we can cut our way out. Grant later wrote that it seemed a new revelation to officers and soldiers. They attacked the Confederates head-on and fought their way to their boats. Grant's men reached the boats in plenty of time, but they couldn't leave until the, take, the wounded were taken aboard. Grant feared a surprise attack from the cornfields in the woods near the docking area, so he took his horse into a cornfield to see if he could locate the enemy. The corn was so high it hid a man on a horse. The general had gone only a few hundred yards when he saw a body of southern troops marching past about fifty yards away. Hoping he hadn't been seen, Grant started back to the boats. But he had been seen. General Leonidas Polk, the rebel unit commander, told some of his men, There's a Yankee. You may try your marksmanship on him if you wish. But nobody fired. Close call number two. Grant rode out of the cornfield in the woods, now infiltrated by Confederates who'd been shooting at the boats, and found the boats had started to pull away from the shore. Now he was caught. On one side of the river was a 12-foot embankment. Behind him were Confederates. Fortunately, the boats had not started their engines. The captain was able to run out the gangplank full length. Grant and his horse slid down the embankment onto the boat. He'd escaped a third time. After tending to his horses, Grant went to the captain's cabin to rest, but stayed only a few seconds. He'd stretched out on the captain's couch for a moment, and seconds after he got up, a Confederate bullet came into the cabin and crashed into the head of the couch, penetrated it, and lodged in the foot. For the fourth time that day, U.S. Grant escaped by seconds or inches, death or capture. Both sides claim victory in the skirmish, but the real victory appears to have been circumstance. At the Battle of Belmont, where history was decided, not by the battle itself, but by the close calls that one man experienced during that fight, when inches, seconds, maybe some personal initiative could have changed the course of history. The Battle of Belmont on this date, the 7th of November in 1861. Why is it so tough for a foreigner to buy a stock in China? Let Marketplace be your guide to the modern world. Subscribe to the Marketplace Tech Report podcast. Find it on iTunes or at marketplace.org slash podcasts. From APM in New York, I'm David Brancaccio with the global perspective on business and economics. Except for a few special people, generally you can't just buy stock in a Chinese company on the Chinese stock market. However, that could soon change, according to the Wall Street Journal today. What has taken China so long and what will these reported changes mean? In Shanghai, Sean Ryan is Managing Director of the China Market Research Group. Thanks for joining us. It's always good to be here, David. Why these limits in the first place on an American, for instance, or a European wanting to buy some Chinese stocks in China? The Chinese government has always prevented everyday Americans from buying equities in the Chinese stock markets because they're very scared about manipulation in the financial system because they run in a command economy and they're not really prepared for fluctuations like we are in the United States. So right now, typically, if, say, an American investor wanted to place a bet on more Chinese growth, they might buy Caterpillar stock, an American company that does a lot of business over there. But if these reforms go through, you could actually buy a Chinese stock. Yeah, for the first time, Americans are going to be able to invest directly into Chinese companies that are listed in China. So this is a real game changer for retail investors in the United States. And you see this as a real vote 
toward reform by the Chinese. It's clear that China's economic model doesn't work anymore. It's broken. You can't rely too much on heavy investment and exports. So the government really is pushing for a reform of its financial system. It opened up a free trade zone in Shanghai. It's also starting to allow more of its banks to invest overseas. So this is definitely a key step in creating a more sustainable and healthy economy. Speaking from Shanghai, Sean Ryan, China Market Research Group. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now let's do the numbers. The key index in the thinly traded Shanghai market fell half a percent today. The index in Hong Kong fell seven tenths percent. We'll be covering the launch of the new Twitter stock today. It'll start at twenty six dollars, meaning the stock market will initially value the short message social media and advertising company at eighteen billion dollars. Is it an auspicious day for such a launch? Not really. Dow S and P and Nasdaq futures are down at the moment. The FTSE one hundred in London is down two tenths percent. This week, the Obama administration kicked off a series of public forums to talk about a proposed new rating system for colleges. The plan is light on details so far, but the broad brush idea is to grade colleges on criteria like value and affordability, with the hope of forcing colleges to do a better job. From the Marketplace Education Desk at WYPR, Amy Scott reports. Students shopping for colleges can turn to rankings from U.S. News or the Princeton Review. Why should the Feds get in on the act? Ben Miller is with the New America Foundation and worked in the Obama administration. He says, for starters, the federal government doles out more than 150 billion dollars a year in student loans and grants. There's a sense that the amount of money that's being invested is not achieving the returns that the administration would like to see. The proposed rating system would consider tuition, average debt loads, and graduation rates. Richard Vedder is an economist with the Center for College Affordability and Productivity. My great concern is that we don't have very good measures of the kinds of things、uh, that the administration is interested in. Like what students learn while they're in school and how much they earn after they graduate, the stakes are high. The plan would ultimately limit financial aid for colleges that don't perform. I'm Amy Scott for Marketplace. Do you enjoy the music we play between stories? Visit the Marketplace Music section to browse playlists for all of our programs and to buy those songs on Amazon. A percentage of each purchase goes towards supporting our programs. Find more online at marketplace.org/music. Times they are changing for our friends, the debt collectors. The Federal Consumer Watchdog Agency this week put the industry and consumers on alert that by next year there will be new rules for how we get dunned. Marketplace's economics guy Chris Farrell has more on what the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is up to here. Chris, good morning. How you doing, David? You know, debt collectors are a bit like meter maids. You and I may love them, but they're not exactly popular figures. Beyond that, what is behind the Financial Protection Bureau's moves here? <laughs> okay, here's what's behind it. The debt collection industry has been a bit of the wild west for the past couple of years. And if you look at the Federal Trade Commission, number one complaint from consumers revolves around the debt. Collection industry, and you know the complaints are about they're harassing me, and they don't give me good documentation, and people just don't understand these rules, and they want to pay their debts, but did I really borrow that money? So I think it's about time to clean up this industry, which you know it's an important function, which is if you borrow money, you should pay it back. Yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out. But what is the Financial Protection Bureau? What are they going to focus on? So part of what they're asking is okay. Do consumers get enough information about these alleged debts? And I think that in many cases they don't get enough information. Another part, incendiary topic: the tactics of the debt collectors. And here I just want to highlight something that just reflects this world that we're in, this new world you talk about all the time, which is social media. So there, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau it's worried about texting and social media involved in collecting debts, which I found absolutely fascinating. Now there are critics of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau that think it's just too powerful, not accountable, and may oppose this. But what about banks? Do you think the banks, powerful banks, will push back? You know, you would think that, right? I mean, regulation. But I think the banks actually, to a large extent, are going to welcome. 
this kind of rulemaking because some of the tactics that they've used in recent years, David, it's really backfired on them. The economics maven of marketplace, Chris Farrell, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, David. I like that. All right. Kayaks, like a full-on 123-inch kayak for $11, TVs for $8. For a time yesterday, Walmart's website went haywire and hopes were raised, only to be dashed. Walmart apologizes, but it's not honoring the silly prices. In New York, I'm David Brancaccio with the Marketplace Morning Report. From APM, American Public Media. I can't wait to ship my pants, Dad. I'm just waiting around for the next Miss Universe contest. <laughs> we will win this for Mother Russia! Twitter goes public. Facebook has changed the way we communicate. Twitter has changed everything. NFL names bullying investigator. To find out who knew what and when. Life after Obamacare. A top healthcare.gov official is leaving. Good morning. I'm Steve Kathan with the CBS World News Roundup. It's the most anticipated initial public stock offering since Facebook 18 months ago. Twitter, the microblog website, will sell its first stock at $26 a share. Here's CBS's Pam Coulter. It's done a lot with just 140 characters. I knew it was a story of a company that had changed the world. It's changed everything from what I do to religion to politics. It's everything. New York Times tech writer Nick Bilton on the impact of Twitter, which goes public today. While the microblogging network continues to lose millions, investment analyst Adam Grossman says it's not facing the same doubts that plagued Facebook, whether it could transfer its success from desktop to smartphones and tablets. Twitter doesn't have to prove that it can make the transition to mobile. They've already done that. Seventy percent of users already access Twitter on mobile devices. Andy Serwer, the managing editor of Fortune magazine, is with us. Andy, what do we expect with Twitter stock? Well, I think it's probably a good bet, Steve, that it's going to go up. How far up, no one really knows. And anyone who tells you they do know is like telling you it's going to be sunny in the first day of December in Chicago. They don't. But as we learned from Facebook's IPO, you really don't know what to expect. What has Twitter learned from that episode that uh, will maybe be a bit different for them today? Absolutely. They watch that thing like a hawk. There are a couple things happen with Facebook. Remember, the, the exchange, the NASDAQ kind of messed it up. They're doing their IPO at the New York Stock Exchange instead, number one. Number two, they're not selling as many shares. They're not flooding the market. They're limiting the demand. And number three, they're not pricing it quite so high. So those things are very different. What about Twitter? It's never made a profit. What's the upside that people are excited about that makes it a good investment? Well, it's a leap of faith if you buy the stock because they're not making money. And what you're betting on is the company's going to figure out a way to make money down the road, a la Facebook, a la LinkedIn, a la Yelp. Andy Serwer, Fortune Magazine, thanks. It's worth noting Facebook opened at $38 a share, within months lost 50% of its value, and is now at about $49 a share. Now to Detroit, where three people were killed, seven others injured last night in a barbershop shooting. Somebody got killed, you know. It was obvious all the gunshots, that's all I heard. Just and Police are looking for two suspects. That barbershop is a notorious gambling hangout. An experienced hand has been brought in to investigate the bullying allegations swirling around football's Miami Dolphins. Here's CBS's Peter King. The NFL has asked attorney Ted Wells to lead the investigation, and while the Dolphins say they'll cooperate, coach Joe Philbin says he's done talking. I've said all I can at this time. Starting quarterback Ryan Tannehill had plenty to say, though, painting a different picture of the alleged bully, Richie Incognito. Does he like to give guys a hard time? Yes. Does he like to... So pester guys and have fun, yes. But he brought a lot of laughter to this locker room. He brought a lot of cohesiveness to this locker room. And he, he was the best teammate that I could ask for. Tannehill says Incognito and Jonathan Martin were like brothers, that Incognito would mess with the younger player but was also the first to stand up for him. He says Martin was a hard worker who never let on that anything was wrong. Peter King, CBS News, Orlando. Hall of Fame running back Tony Dorsett says he's been diagnosed with a degenerative condition linked to dementia and depression. He was one of the plaintiffs in a suit against the NFL that was tentatively settled last month. Well, they poked fun at Obamacare at last night's CMA Awards. Obamacare by morning, over six people served. The president was in Texas for a health care pep talk. Let's check in live with White House correspondent Peter Mayer. 
And Steve, he insists Obamacare launch problems will soon be solved. Speaking to volunteers in Dallas, the president described the enrollment hassles. This is like having a, a really good product in a store and the cash registers don't work and there aren't enough parking spots and nobody can get through the door. Later, Mr.